Psalms 11, to the chief musician, a psalm of David. So we know the psalm is David, and we know it's a, it's a hymn, it's a song. In the Lord put I my trust, where we should. David's saying, and David's going to speak to why he's saying this. God is my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? And we're going to assume that this is a time that King Saul is chasing David, or one of David's enemies, and the word has come to David, get to the mountain, flee. The enemy's coming. And David's response, the response is first. I trust in God. Why would I flee? And yet there are times when David did flee. For lo, the wicked bend their bow. Type of the Antichrist. Though the Antichrist mentioned, in, uh, I forget, it's Genesis 4 or 5. You know, he's got the bow, but he ain't got no ammunition. He's going to come in with peace. But he says, bend their bow and make ready the arrow upon the string. It's a bow, an arrow. That they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. And it's not necessarily a war. It's they're, they're ready to go. Privily means the person they're going to, to hit the upright. Those doing right with God. They're going to have no. It's a sniper attack. Here's a man living right by God. The enemy has got the bow and pull. has got the arrow. And then he shoots it. No one knows. And David's responding to it. The, the bird flees to the mountains. David, get out of here. Listen, I trust the Lord. And I know the wicked because they're going, they try to kill us all the time, and we are unaware. You're telling me the enemy's coming, but there's times when the enemy's been here and we didn't even know it. And if the foundations be destroyed, if I leave, if I turn my back on God. What can the righteous do? So your answer is just flee, go to the mountains. Okay, well, I trust God. Wicked are always our enemy. And if we take off and we go to the mountains, what about the righteous here? We got to stand up and take a fight. The Lord is his holy temple. It would be in Jerusalem. The Lord's throne is in heaven. So in heaven is God's throne. We see that in uh, Revelation chapter 4. When the door is open, the church is raptured, there's a throne. So that's heaven. Scripture with scripture. His eyes behold, his eyelids try the children of men, all men. Doesn't say the saved men, doesn't say lost men, doesn't say wicked men, doesn't say unrighteous men, doesn't say righteous men. It says children of men. God sees what we're going to do. And there'll be times when a Christian does something out of his ordinary routine. You know, he may be walking down the street and God says, well, give that guy a gospel track. That guy, God may be trying that, that man that you're going to give the gospel track to say, how's he going to respond? How's he going to act? And we don't know if we're dealing with a lost man or a saved man. Sometimes if we deal with the same man, we may get an angry attitude. God's like, well, you blew that one again, or you blew that. Or maybe a lost man saying, God, I want to do what you want me to do. Okay, I'll put a saved man in front of you and give you a gospel track, and you get angry. That's not the right attitude. Got to work with you a little more. The Lord tries the righteous. All right, there's one class of people. He, he, he tries the children of man, then he tries the righteous. Abraham, you're going to believe that I'm going to give you a child? Yes, I am. So what was that ordeal with you and Hagar and, and uh, Sarai? Lost a little faith there, didn't you, Abraham? Sarai, did you not believe in me? Why are you crybabying that that? Handmade Hagar giving you a hard time and her son giving your son a hard Should have just trusted me. Abraham, why don't you take your only begotten son? I want you to take your only son. I want you to take him up to the mountain. I want you to sacrifice him. And Abraham said, yep. Yeah. And he tells the two men, I'm going up to the mountain and we will come back. We? Who? The mouse in his pocket? Absolutely not. 
Abraham and his son Isaac weren't coming back. Isaac believed in the resurrection. So there are things that God will try. Jesus said, you know, if you're unfaithful in, you know, a lot of man, a little mammon, you're not faithful in the little things, excuse me. Well, how are you going to be faithful in much? God says, listen, I'll try very little. Okay, let's see how you do. Uh, you want this whole church, you want a whole congregation of church people, you want to be their pastor, and you can't even handle a Sunday school classroom. You know, you want to be this world greatest soul winner. You want to go and be a missionary to the world. And your next door neighbor doesn't know anything about Jesus Christ. I mean, how many neighbors of Christians don't know Jesus from their neighbor? But the wicked and him that loveth violence, his soul hateth. Look at, see that? His soul, God. God has the eternal soul. Well, let's, let's quote the verse again. Well, not a verse, but God hates the sin but loves the sinner. What do you do with that verse? Come on, tell me. You got the wicked and you got the one that loveth violence. His soul, God hated. Oh, I don't read the Old Testament. Oh, okay. There it is. God hates. There's a holy and righteous hate. The Bible says for us to hate sin. When you look at Christians today, that's anything but. They love their sin. Upon the wicked, now this is tribulation. Watch. If you read the book of Revelation, upon the wicked, that'd be the Antichrist, he shall rain snares of fire. I'm going, he shall rain snares, that's traps, nets, pits. We need trap animals and men. Fire and brimstone. Well, that was Sodom and Gomorrah. God was angry and hated them. That's going to happen. There's there's one, uh, I think it was an asteroid, something like that. I forget what it says. It's called Wormwood. It's going to come and crash the earth, make the waters bitter. Then there's one time in the tribulation, there, there's a, a, a hail the size of a talent knocking people in the head. A terrible tempest. There's some storms in the, in the, tri in the tribulation period. So this, David says, also jumps all the way into the tribulation period. This shall be the portion of their cup. Now that cup, when you got a cup like this, it's not literal filled with drink. You got a cup like this, this is a cup of judgment. <clears throat> and there's times in the tribulation period, this stuff is going to happen and it's going to be no death. <clears throat> One point it says they're going to seek death and they're not going to find death. Now this is very important when we study this type of cup. Because when you see Jesus in the garden and he's praying to the Father, he says, let this cup pass. There are morons and idiots with doctorates and PhDs that say, oh, he's, pa he's praying to God that death will not happen. Absolutely, correctly not. When he told his disciples, take this cup, this cup is the blood of the New Testament. What is the blood of Jesus Christ? It cleanses from all sins. What is the cup that Jesus is praying God? Jesus is not afraid of death. He knows in three days and three nights he's coming out victorious. He's coming out. He's going to conquer it. He's going to have the keys of death. In hell. Why would he be afraid of death? I'll tell you what Jesus Christ didn't want. i tell you what, he did not want that cup. He did not want the cup of sin. He did not want his Holy Soul. He did not want his Holy Spirit. He did not want, I'm talking about yeah, Holy Spirit. He did not want his Holy Flesh. He didn't want his Holy Life. He did not want his attribute of being holy and righteous. He didn't want to be the God part of him. He didn't want to have anything to do with that sin. He didn't want to take on the sins of mankind. That's the cup. Oh, Father, wait a minute. You know, you and I have been dwelling in heaven for all eternity. And you know what? Of, of all the patriarchs that we saw, I have you and I have never cried at a funeral like I cried at Lazarus' funeral. Now, let me tell you something, Father, about this sin. It is vile and it's wicked. 
And when you talk about, Father, when you came down with those angels that we read today as, as a family, and they came into Sodom and Gomorrah, and they saw the sexual morality, and it is a vile, wicked sin of sexual morality that men want to have sex with men. That, that's abomination, God. Said. But when Jesus said, you know what, Father? I've seen adultery. I've seen sodomy. I've seen people steal. I've seen people kill. I see people want to kill me. I see people didn't want the truth. I see people who didn't want to have anything to do with you. I've seen people who are taking the, the, the name of the Lord in vain. I've seen them violate the Sabbath. And I, I, Father, I am holy. And we have told people, be ye holy for I am holy. That moment I take that cup of sin. And that cup of sin is every single filthy sin that man has done as far as a little sin as big as the big sin the judgment of god upon sin jesus like i'd rather not have that not the death he said nevertheless thy will father will be done i will take the sin when the holy and righteous Jesus, who the Jehovah Witnesses say is not God and he is God, when he looks at that cup and he's filled with the filth of man, that is going to violate my holiness. For a moment in time, the holy and righteous God, Jesus Christ, he's going to be viled with sin. Uh, well, I got this right here. For he has made him to be sin for us. There's that cup. Who knew no sin. He has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we may have the righteousness of God in him. That moment of time when Jesus is on that cross and all the filthiness of man poured out on the holy right. And I'm not misquoting the scripture. I just say, that moment that the sinless Christ, the sinless God made him to be sin. Jesus Christ all the filthiness of sin. That's that cup. And that's the cup that I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I became saved. And I won't get the wrath of God. And as far as a born again Bible believing Christian. And I'm saved. And I know it. The worst that I can do if I get sin. And, and I, I die or I get raptured out of here. Is I'm going to get wood, hay or stubble. It's just going to turn to ashes and suffer a lot. Babylon has a cup and it's filled to the brim. It's overflowing of the filth and the rottenness of that church. The cup that Sodom and Gomorrah filled up with all the wickedness and filth of sin. And finally, God got the point. He saw that cup overthrown. We got to go down there. We got to do something. Every nation has a cup. Now, I'm not going to go through I think maybe, I think every Christian has a cup. And it was great about if there is a Christian cup, and I don't know, as we fill that thing up with sin, and if we say, Lord Jesus, forgive us the sins, we name them out, and we seriously confess our sins. The Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all right. takes that cup and pours it out. Okay, refill. I don't want you to refill it, but you're going to. And one of those one of those sins that can fill that cup over the blend that even says in scripture, if you take the Lord's Supper unwillingly and you take it, you know, without no due regard, one of the things is Paul says you sleep. That's death. The wages of sin is death. A Christian could commit so many sins that that cup gets oh, that's that's it. I'll tell you how we clean that cup out with the blood, sir. Nope. Death. When the cup gets full, the wages of sin is death. Happens for nations. Happens for people. Boom. That's it. You're dead. You're gone. He says that the wicked, the Antichrist has a cup. What's that cup? We know exactly what that cup is. Seven years. You realize how many years the cup the devil has? Ever since he went after Eve in the garden, I don't know how many years it's been. I'm not going to rely on our calendars on that because our calendars are definitely wrong. We're going by a Roman calendar. I guarantee God doesn't go by a Roman calendar. But look how many years and look how much the devil has done with his cup. And that can never be cleansed. And when we talk about Mystery Babylon in the book of Revelation, it says she's got a cup. Realize how long the Catholic Church has practiced the deeds and how many saints they have killed. I mean, true saints. How many times they shut the Bible. How many souls they condemned to hell for all eternity. All the popes and all the teachings and traditions against the word of God. And you know what? The Catholic Church ain't finished until halfway through the tribulation period. Not all the way near the end of the tribulation period. 
You can't have a standard of the cup say, okay, when the nation gets this far, because the devil's been farther than Sodom and Gomorrah. The, Bab the, the Babylon, the Catholic Church has been sure still going long past the long past the church age, past the rapture, into the tribulation period, and then have almost through with the, the tribulation period. Then we see the cup filled with all the nations. Adolf Hitler, his cup brought the end of World War II. God says, "All right, you've killed enough Jews." I'm going to curse you because you cursed them. Your cup is finished. Wipe that cup, that cup away. Not really. In the cup, there's, there's a cup you know you drink from. Nehemiah took grapes. He put it in the king's cup. He smushed them up and made grape juice, fresh new wine. That's a drinking cup. And then there's a cup of the wrath of God. That's what Jesus told the Father. Oh, Lord God, Father, if I can pass that. Not death. So shall be the portion of their cup. What? Fire, brimstone. Everything that God throws down, the seven seals, the seven vows, uh, seven trumpets, the three woes, is what man gets for their reactions to the nation of Israel. Be not deceived, God's not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that he shall also reap. That goes forth in the tribulation period. Two. For the righteous God, Lord loveth the righteous. So if he loves the righteous and needs a holy and righteous God, guess who he would hate? Uh, I won't even have you. I won't go tick, tock, tick, tock. I mean, it's. Oh, so we eliminate that, that the Lord loves the righteous. We eliminate, but God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. You just violated Psalms 11. We just read that God hates the wicked. Wait, where, where is he? Uh, hey, uh, where is it at? The violence his soul hateth. The wicked he hates. So what's the opposite? The righteous the Lord loveth. Don't come up with, oh, God hates the sin and he loves the sinner. You just put the sinner and the righteous in a yoke that God said that. No, I don't. Oh, well, you know, a child, of God, a child of God, yeah. When a child does wrong, you love your child because they're your children, but you got to punish them. But when they're not your child, you make, when God hates the sin and loves the sin, you make every sinner a child of God that way. That's not true. Matthew chapter 12, every idle word shall man give an account thereof. Will be. His countenance, again, that's his facial expression. Like a man, you know, they just gave him a surprise party. Woo. That moment you're going down the road and you find somebody's coming at you the wrong way and the wrong side of the road. That's a countenance. Oh. Does behold the upright. So, when you're upright, God's watching. You know, now we've seen in Psalms, 11 Psalms. Sometimes we say, Lord God, you know, you're not listening. He's listening. He just, he's not answering his time yet. But if you're righteous, you're a child of God. He's watching you. He's also, the Bible says, he's watching the evil too. You got a guy who has all seeing eyes. 